Hi, um, good afternoon, I guess, everyone. Um, my name is Tin Zhao, and this is Scott Matsumoto, and we'll be talking about uh, threat modeling and how we apply this uh, new approach at uh, Interit. Um, many of you may not be familiar with Interit. Um, uh, basically, we are an American uh, company. Uh, we do a lot of uh, tax preparation software for uh, the US and Canada, and we do a lot of um, small business kind of um, applications like bookkeeping, you know, pre-accounting. Personal finance, man. It's like my, my whole yeah. life is run. And, and Mint, Mint. Uh, many of you may be thought about Mint. So and this is Scott. I'm Scott Matsumoto. I'm a principal consultant at Sigital. I'm sure you've heard of Intuit, and I doubt you've heard of Sigital. I mean, billion dollar <laughs> company. I, I, well, we're private, so we can't even say, but tiny little company. Okay. But the, these guys are the thought leaders in this uh, industry. So. Um, yeah, so we'll share our experience about threat modeling and how we uh, get to where we got to. Yeah, I think we're gonna, what we're gonna talk about, so you can see the agenda. Um, so the background is that uh, Intuit had uh, hired Sigital to come in and take a look at what they were doing with, around threat modeling. Um, there was a, a whole bunch of, there were about three different versions of threat modeling going yep. on in the company, right? Yep. And um, so we came in and took a look, and this whole thing about unifying it is, it was trying to create a model that would work for these different groups. Um, to do so, so we're gonna talk about, so the really the meat of this thing is really in the lessons and takeaways um, for this talk, because you know, you all probably have some kind of threat modeling process or practice within your organization. Um, and so the, the lessons from Intuit, I thought we thought, Tim and I thought would be very valuable to help you guys mature those, mature that. Uh, to do that, we're gonna talk a little bit about the threat model, that system threat modeling thing. So we're gonna talk about the process a little bit, uh, just to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Um, then Tim will do really the lessons from Intuit. Uh, the protocol threat modeling, it's something that kind of came out of the work we did with Intuit. They did a lot of, there was a very specific type of thing that they did um, around different protocols, sequences, like startup sequences. Um, so we applied our various techniques to that. So you'll see that, and I think that's, that's kind of cool. And then we'll just kind of wrap it up and then you can go to lunch. Yep, so yeah, so let's get started. So a little bit about background at in, uh, about this. Oh, I already did that part, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so, um, so Intuit had been doing this uh, threat modeling uh, in a different ways for many years, but uh, the, probably the most common approach that we had used in the past is, of course, Stride. And that's not surprising because um, we hired one guy from Microsoft uh, and he, he worked at Intuit for a while. We got a lot of these practices. Of, and of course, when Microsoft had this uh, threat modeling book and all the mind share about it. So we, we started doing uh, the Stride approach. And, any of you not familiar with STRIDE and what, what it stands for? Okay, so STRIDE. Uh, oh, you're gonna have to do that. We're gonna do that. No, 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 we, we can't get, uh, come see us afterwards. We'll, we'll, we'll do right. it. So, so, stri so from STRIDE that we find out that, oh, STRIDE is uh, too time consuming. You know, not every uh, dev team has like a data flow diagrams. And a lot of times, you know, the web applications and stuff, that's not quite applicable or time efficient. So we kind of diverge from, uh, uh, stride to like you know more streamlined approach or we just call it you know yeah, homegrown I, number one and then they're like system guys like who wanted to do like slightly different but their uh, thought process is about the same but uh, the assets that they're protecting are different so we, we came up with uh, strike uh, homegrown number two yeah we I mean you guys we came in we looked at it and there was like I said there the, the approaches were very different stride was really the incumbent um, it's it's you know it's the Microsoft based approach um, but I think the goals were, you know, from, from your boss, Rinky, was we want one way to do it across all teams. So these were different or parts of the organization doing it differently. Um, and I think one of the things that came across as we, you know, being consultants, you have to go in and you interview and you talk to them and you tell them what time it is based on what time's on their watch. Um, they, you know, they're like, create the shared vision. And, but I, you know, and I thought, well, that was kind of a, a kooky statement. But really, at the end of the day, what you do want to do is you want to create a shared vision with the development teams so that the, the, the development teams are bought into the things that you're going to say in your threat model that they need to fix. Okay. Yeah, so we also wanted to have a common language and common side of diagrams and common uh, template for doing this. So, you know, uh, that's workable across uh, different uh, business units and different product lines in the company. So. 
Yeah, so we're going to talk about, you know, uh, definition of the, pro so this, this is uh, the program elements that we have at the uh, into it. So the, our first goal is to, you know, define the process, you know, define this, uh, what, what we end up calling the unified threat modeling, that's unified insight into it, uh, not necessarily that uh, industry-wide. And then we st started with having that uh, training, formal training material and started conducting training. So these two are done. And then our bosses challenge us with like, uh, you know, what is the return on investment? How do we measure this uh, metrics on these uh, uh, threat modeling exercise? So we're working on that and also Intuit is a multi-business, a multi-business unit, multiple business line uh, company. So how do we scale this across, you know, uh, these multiple uh, locations, multiple teams with, um, in, in an efficient way? So that's what we keep working on these days. So uh, we're going to start talking about, I think this is your slide. Oh, this is my slide? Okay, so the threat modeling approach. Oh, right, 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 yeah. Okay, so, this, so we, we, built, we built a lot of this based on our digital process. Um, but we adapted it quite a bit for Intuit. Um, so it's, for the first thing is defining the scope. One of the things we found out is that people would threat model the entire system, and yet the development team was only changing one particular piece. Um, so that was an important piece. Uh, modeling the threat structure, uh, what, you know, the, looking at assets, things you're protecting, the controls that, that are protecting those assets, and then looking at the uh, attacker profiles or the attackers um, for that. That's a, that was that was you know straight out of our the digital threat modeling process. Uh, the other thing that we did with Intuit and was rare, it was really important was there was a, a requirement to use the existing development artifacts. Um, the, their development teams actually created a lot of models. They were uh, pretty pretty advanced in terms of your use of RUP, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the, one of the things about Stride is that you have to create data flow diagrams. And that was one of the things, there were a couple things that, that, the, that the teams were struggling with. One was having to get, create other diagrams where all of these artifacts already existed. So one of the requirements was reuse whatever development creates uh, to that extent as possible. And then, um, and like I said, the other thing was to scope it down. Um, so the, the part that came out of it was, um, you know, the system threat models were, were pretty much what you kind of will see. If you use Stride, you're used to seeing them as data flow diagrams. You figure out where, are the, you know, where, where the attackers are. Um, but what we found is that the system gives us a really nice idea of where the various com software components are, the relationships between them, where, and then where are the attackers and controls and assets. And we'll get into all, we'll, these are tiny little pictures and we'll, <coughs> kind of do a bigger pictures of them a little bit. Um, but oftentimes what we find is that between any two components, there's a line in the system diagram up on the top. And often there's message exchanges. For distributed systems, there are often message exchanges and very complicated sets of exchanges, either because it's a startup sequence or it's because it's a formal protocol. And um, Intuit was doing, had a lot of common components. They had authorization components. They had startup sequences, you know, very, you know for starting up various kinds of uh, uh, infrastructure pieces. Um, and so looking at that, those, the detail of those sequences, protocols or sequences, was another thing that they did a lot of. And so what we did is we, ad we adapted, the, the top diagram is kind of RUP-like pretty much a component diagram with some additional flow control in there. Then we, we for the protocol threat model, we used a sequence diagram, which was a very good, a nice representation, things that, it was, a, it was a representation that the dev teams were already using for designing the protocols. Um, and we added, we took that and we added the threat structure to that. And that's what, when, that's what we came out with a kind of a different technique for threat modeling for that particular uh, type of problem. Yep. So let's uh, dig a little deeper into you know what uh, what the system threat modeling means, right? So um, based on our experience and also experience at uh, Citadel, a lot of development teams they don't have the data flow diagram per se like the Microsoft uh, prescribes, but they do have a lot of diagrams like that, right? At the least, you know they have this uh, deployment model, deployment diagram because they have to tell operation folks like you know hey I want this software to be de deployed that way, and they do oftentimes have like the layer model, logical model, all these software components. So we 
We base our uh, exercise on that and from these uh, type of documents and information that we have, we have to come up with this um, thing called, uh, the, the, like, I think the term is the simplified system model, right? This is a drawing of this software system at um, the, where the components are, how they interact with each other. So you see these um, uh, boxes, like these boxes are the software components, right? The app server and the web server. And then they are of different shape, right? So that, what that means is like uh, some of them are in scope. That means that we'll dig deep into that component and uh, for a model. It. Some of them are out of scope. So that means that, you know, we know that that system exists, but we don't really care about the security implications of that. And some of them are out of, uh, partially in scope. So what that means is that, you know, we don't really go do the full threat modeling for that component, but we do care about how it, how we interact with the component. So that would be something like the, um, you know, SSO may be uh, partially in scope, and also like the 4M software that, you know, in this uh, TWICE system that we uh, use for the class, they, they use the V, uh, we use the V bulletin as an example. So that would be the, um, that would be partially in scope because, you know, we do care about how we interact with them. And then we draw these, uh, tr uh, what they call the trust boundaries. That's pretty much the same as a uh, similar approach to Microsoft. But uh, these trust boundaries are usually based on the network boundaries. So we have the data center, you know, internet, and we can, you know, do like the restricted part of the data center. We can put like the corporate uh, network and so on, depending on your architecture. There are some, I think there are builds in this one. No. So this one should, so, so the builds actually show where from the, those previous diagrams, where we extracted the different parts of them into create this, 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 this simplified model. One of the things that we found that, that we're finding out at Sigital about threat modeling um, and scaling it in our, our organization is that this is the hardest part. The system analysis is fig and figuring out how all these things fit together is really the, one of the key things that you have to have staff do and teach them how to do. Um, it is probably one of the hardest things uh, to do as well. So it is the same experience at Intuit as well. Even the experienced software architects, when they extract you know, this kind of information from what they have, you know, the, it's a judgment call sometimes, like you know, how, what kind of scope we want to apply and also you know, how, much, how deep we want to go in. So this is the first step that we come up with. Uh, yeah. But the nice thing about this is that we're using those diagrams that they <laughs> already know about. So we are, right. we're, we're already building a common language between security and development. I, th I thought right. that was, I think that's worked right. out pretty well for you, right? Yep, yep, it yeah. does. And the next step that we do is like we put these uh, labels like uh, assets and uh, security controls and attacker profile. So what are the assets, right? Um, so assets are anything that you want to protect. That's, as simple the definition as I can give. Right, so assets usually can be of uh, asset types, like specific assets, like the data or your compute resources. But assets can also be capabilities, right? So some functions that need protection. So a lot of people, are, it's easy to understand data as an asset or the network as an asset, the computer as an asset, but some of the capabilities uh, you have a hard time coming up with. So I give the example of like, hey, what, is your, what about your open, um, mail server, open mail relay, right? So that may not, you may not think of it as an asset, but if that uh, relay can be abused and people using it to send uh, spam, then you know, your IP address could get banned. So that's an asset that, that needs protection. And in this case, you know, we're protecting the reputation of the IP address underneath, but, um, but you have to recognize, it's easier to get to that through the capability. And then we think about attacker profiles. So, um, the term here, we don't use attackers, we use attacker profiles. Because the attacker can be, your profile can be different based on where you are in the network, where you're in the trust boundary. So I'm a person and I'm an employee at Intuit, right? But when I'm sitting at home, when I'm not connected to any uh, Intuit VPN or anything like that, then I will be uh, just an anonymous hacker on the internet. I'm just someone with an IP address. So that's one profile of an attacker we, that we put it in the list called the canonical list of attackers. So second, it's like, you know, I'm really motivated to uh, hack a system. So what can I do? Uh, I, I can get an account. You know, a lot of times I can sign up for an account with very little or very minimal fee, or even if I have to pay like $500 to get this account, if I'm motivated, I'll sign this up. Then my attack profile, although I'm the same person, my attack profile is different now, right? I'm, an, I'm now an authenticated user to the system. So that's a diff another attack profile that we put in the canonical list of attack profiles. And then I'm an employee, I go to work, and then I'm on my corporate network, and I have a different level of access to the systems. And if I were a sysadmin or a network admin, then I have a different level of access to the system. So these are the different attacker 
profiles. And what about if you use cloud, right? The cloud computing. So the cloud provider may be an attacker, right? He may be a malicious cloud provider who has access to your um, right. system and data. Yeah, and so I think the other the other piece is the security controls. And I was I was I don't know if you how many of you are here for for uh, Mark's discussion about CSP. Um, but that's a security control, and I think we often forget to add in the controls because for the threat model for us is it's the residual risk, it's the value of the asset, the controls that you have in place. So we want to make sure we we have those already, um, and then it's really it's juxtaposing it that threat structure against the system structure. What what is juxtapose? I mean, yeah. I, don't, we don't, I don't see that word every day. Yeah, yeah. So 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 ten, ten yesterday we were going through the slides. He goes, I hate that word. And then one of our guys, or one of our guys that, you know, um, he runs our, our, uh, our architecture practice. He has literally gone through all of our slides and taken the words juxtapose out of every single slide. Uh, you know, so juxtapose is, it's, I mean, I think that's really what it comes down to, man. It's like you're, you're looking at the system structure. And you're going, I got this, and, I, and this is what I'm trying to protect, and, you know, so the, the security structure. And you're really trying to play them off one another, uh, against one another. So I know that in the, in the states where we've gotten rid of the SAT words, I don't know if you guys are like, do you have SATs here? No. Oh. My. <laughs> but anyway, all right. So we'll we'll, we'll save that one. Oh so, yeah. So so we we get that, and we identify these assets and attacker profiles and uh, security controls. So what we do next is like put these labels on the system, right? So where so where are the asset? You know, what are the assets and where do they reside? So and the same asset can be of different places, right? Um, so. Here, you know, uh, something like the member-only content, maybe a different thing. Session IDs or the credentials, session credentials can be on the on these uh, connections, or they could also reside in the system. So we attach these labels, and then we do the same thing for the controls, right? And the thing to uh, the, the thing that we really emphasize for control is that not to make these controls up. So when you're analyzing a system, you really find the controls that do exist in the system and put it there. You don't put the controls that should be there you put the controls that are there onto the diagram. Right, and I think that one of the things we found is that the developers are really good at knowing, knowing where the controls are, because they've, they've implemented them, or right. they're designing them in. Right. And so, you know, so that, that part, so this part of the system, a lot of it can be done by the developers. Right, well, at least they have a lot of information. Goals, right? Yeah, yeah. And then we attach these uh, attacker profiles. And you might notice that attacker profiles are attached to these uh, trust boundaries. Right, so yeah, we put the you know, user machine in one trust boundary, the local LAN in another trust boundary or trust zone, and the internet and data center, because you know, that depending on the, where they are on the network, they have a different uh, point of view to the system. Right, and, and when I think from, you know, we, we struggled at Sigital with having a common definition of attack surface. Um, and by physically placing the attacker profile um, on the diagram, it helps us understand or helped at least help me use create a, a common language around what is attack surface because attack surface are all the APIs and entry points that the attacker can actually have access to given their location within the scheme of the system. Right, and then we trace from the attacker profile to the uh, to the assets. Right, so from APO two, how can I get access to one of the assets, and what are the controls that are that are in there, what are the controls that are not in there, what are the controls that are there, but you know, I can e easily circumvent. Yeah, I think we're just like, yep. so, so that's this slide. That is this slide. Yeah. So our goal is to you know, record the uh, missing controls or the weak controls, and they go into what we call the threat table. Yeah. So you're going to go through, so you're actually gonna go through there. One, one of the things that I think that came out that we didn't put in the slides, so yeah, those actually slides were, were from the training that Tin talked about earlier. Um, and it was like one of, I think that's one of the key things of, of their program. Uh, one thing that didn't come out though is it, that we didn't include in the slides. We're, the goal was, of these slides was not to teach you how to do this today. Uh, it was just to kind of level set. But the, um, is really the notion of canonical attackers. So you have a, a set of pre-baked attackers built in. Um, and then I know Shannon and I, this, Shannon is one of the, his, his colleagues, have been looking at the idea of taking these diagrams here with um, the attackers, the assets, the controls, especially around the controls, and pre-building, you know, we're calling them blueprints. So, you know, if you think about, um, you're trying to deploy something, um, say you're trying to do a, a deployment on AWS, and 
your, you know, so something kind of new, you could actually create these pre-built, you know, models that have the system piece components. They have the attack, the canonical attackers. They have the assets that you can see, you know, across the organization and the controls that the organization has. Because like your, you, you know, the security organization has, you know, like pre-built authentication right. and authorization components. Right, and that works for the software side as well. You know, if you have like the uh, template, so that's part of our exercise to how to how to scale this across the enterprise. Yeah, exactly. So the yeah. blueprints will help us scale, I think. Yep. So one of the, uh, you know, I want to share like, you know, what we have learned from applying this, you know, new approach and what, you know, um, about teaching. So one thing is about classroom and another thing is about, you know, what are the challenges that uh, we faced and also what are the wins that we had, right? So uh, classroom, uh, what works for the classroom is that we have this self-contained course, right? So you, you show up to the class as you are and we give everything to the, um, in the class, so we have our printed charts, and you know we have all the handouts and the slides and so on. And we didn't give anything away in the beginning, but so you know the, we keep some of the surprises for the class. And also, what helps is that we uh, uh, we group the students to get together into uh, different groups. So uh, people who show up, like they might have different backgrounds. Some of them are uh, dev leads, architects, uh, coders, testers, operation folks, DBAs, and a few security people. We uh, form like small groups of like four to five people into a uh, different, um, with a different skill set, and we work them, have them work together to solve this problem. It's a very good team-based problem solving, and they learn from each other's strengths and weaknesses. Right, this is a learn by doing, because I think that's the other lesson that we've learned at Sigital is that you learn this by doing it. There is, you, know, you can't read a book about it. Um, you, you know, the, the technique can be described very simply. I mean, you know, you could see on there, we can describe it in three slides but actually doing it, applying it to a system, there are a lot of judgment calls. Um, I, I kind of liking it, liken it to learning how to drive. I, there's, there are a few gray hairs here. So you've, I'm <laughs> sure you have, you have kids, anyone who taught their, their, their child how to drive a car? Who's, who's, who, who, oh, come on. <laughs> I'm the only one here? All right, one more. Seriously? Well, they do have good public transportation here. Oh, okay, okay, that's true. <laughs> So in the States, where everybody has a car, we have 10 of them, okay, per household. Um, in teaching them how to, teaching your child how to drive is like one of the rites of passage of fatherhood, right? So, you know, you can describe how to drive a car pretty simply. You know, you step on the brake to stop the car, you put foot on the gas, you know, you turn the wheel. Okay, so if you've ever driven with a learning driver, you think stopping a car was an easy thing to do. Well, every time with my daughters, the first time they go out, you say you put the foot on the brake and then you ease it off, right? That's how you stop. Every time. How many times? Like, boom, boom, <laughs> right? Well, the same thing with the threat modeling, right? The concept is really clear. Uh, there are yeah. only three parts involved, like attackers and assets and the uh, controls, right? They're, they're, they're just three things, like the uh, gas and the brake and the <laughs> steering wheel in a car. But, you know, there's so much theory that you can explain, but that really you have to get into the car and you have to drive it. And you drive it in the parking lot first. You know, and then you get onto the roads and the freeway. Uh, we call it freeway. And the, the training really does that, I think. Yeah. yeah. And the one other mindset difference that I, uh, one example that I want to point out is like when developers think about the system, they think about the assets first. And when security people, security engineers are in that group, they think about attackers first. So, you know, you, you can see the mindset difference. So some of the challenges that we had, um, the term threat modeling itself, it, it sometimes means different things to different people. So every time I, I, before I start the class, I ask them like, what does threat modeling mean to you? And like, you know, 80, 90% of the time, they have different meaning of threat modeling. So the term, getting everybody on the same term is a challenge. It's like a foreign language to a lot of people. And the time commitment, you know, uh, we do that as a one day training for, the, uh, for about seven, eight hours. So um, for a lot of busy people uh, with the deadlines and projects, uh, committing a day out of their schedule is pretty tough. And, uh, another challenge that we have is like when security uh, goes in and leads these projects and the threat modeling gets done, but uh, we've been hoping and uh, pushing the development side to take the lead on it, and that has been uh, still an ongoing process. Well, you're still in the middle of that. I mean, that's yeah. the goal, the this goal, is still a journey. Yeah, the goal, is, the goal is to have dev start driving some of this and getting as much of that, that the threat model done as possible. Right. And, um, but what are the wins? Right, so 
the win that everybody agrees on, even people come from different um, backgrounds to the threat model training, is that it instills the security mindset into them. Right, so uh, what I mean is that uh, they, they learn more about security now. Whatever their baseline is, they do definitely benefit from uh, coming to the class. And second is the alignment of goals, both from doing these exercises in class and also doing uh, practice in the threat modeling. It's like, hey, you know, uh, these are the assets that you know about, and these are assets because they are what protecting, right? Anything that is what protection is an asset. So, hey, you know, the, we, we have alignment of goals this way. These are the um, assets. And where are the controls to protect them, right? If they are missing or weak, you know, we, uh, they know that, hey, you're not protecting it well enough. Um, there are bugs, uh, flaws that can only be uh, discovered by threat modeling, yeah. like the design flaws, logic flaws. Business logic flaws, yeah. I mean, I think like, the protocol thing was a great example uh, you know, of, of things that, if you're looking at a protocol, De de deciphering the protocol, all the exchange, the message exchanges, the message contents is really difficult to do if you're either if you are just trying to reverse it from a black box point of view, or if you, or especially if you have the code. Um, and like I said, oftentimes the developers, even just to figure this out, have built a sequence diagram. Um, you know, and so what we've done is we, so that technique uses the sequence diagram. We annotate it with some other stuff because there's. It's really, a lot of times, it's really the messages and stuff inside of that and the crypto involved in protecting that. But again, it's a shorthand. It gets you there, and it gets you earlier in the process. Yeah, these are the flaws that wouldn't have been detected by other methods like you know, uh, statical analysis and so on. Right, and also the big win for us is like consistent language, consistent set of diagrams. What we do is that we give out this uh, uh, VCO stencils after the class, so they can start doing this. Um, and also, even the document format that we have a template for documenting this. So, if I have to go in and help, you know, with a new business or new product that I'm not familiar with, at least I have some familiarity with the tools and the format and the language. And, and within the security team too, it's just like if yeah. you if you give one, someone on Shannon's team a document, or if they start it, you guys can finish it. Yeah. Yeah. So there are different teams within Intuit. There are multiple security teams. I mean, think about it. Right. Yeah. That's a pretty go big company with uh, yeah, multiple yeah. product exactly. lines. So. Yeah, then we get back into like details about you know what the protocol threat modeling is. Yeah, we'll run you through that pretty quickly because oh yeah, we're getting close to lunchtime. I, I'm I'm hungry. I don't know <laughs> how you guys like survive uh, in, out here. It's like noon is my lunchtime. Okay, so yeah, there was so you, know, you can see actually we didn't change the name on this slide. There was a discussion, a long discussion. No one could agree on what the name of this thing was. It's we call it <laughs> protocol threat modeling, but oh it's, no, it's a sequence. No, it's for APIs. It's for, so we just. Being the good consultants, it's everything, right? Um, <laughs> but it, as I said, it comes down to there, these are things: there are sequences of events, of messages, of API calls that have to be that have to be protected. Uh, we can just go go on. Um, so, in terms of the canonical canonical attacker profiles, there are only two to worry about. Since you're really worried about either the malicious client or the man in the middle. So, because remember, this is not a general the whole system. This is just the interactions between two, any two components. Um, right, so there are only two parties involved at a time, although you might be looking at a sequence diagram with like, you know, uh, five, six different objects in it. At any point in time, there are only two parties. Right, and you've seen sequence diagrams that do between two, there are multiple parties, but what you're always doing is you're always taking, you know, you're always reducing it down to the exchanges between two, um, and so if like in a no-auth thing, your, client, your server might become the client to somebody else. Um, you can see here we have a sequence diagram. You can see we draw all the message exchanges. Um, you know, we, we annotate the, oh, just can you go back just one slide before? Yep, yep. Yeah. We, we annotate the, um, uh, the exchange with the messages and message data. And the same thing, that the message usually are the uh, assets that, that, what's, that is what's protecting. Exactly. And then, you know, these are the uh, things, the, the type of co contents that are in the message. Right. And you can see here, then we also annotate it with the controls. Right. So, so like here, here we're encrypting the password. Yeah, yeah only one, one type exists, right? Yeah. And the attacker profiles, like we said, there are only two. There are only two. So you can figure out like, you know, what's wrong with this uh, protocol, right? If you want to take that as a homework. But, but you, what you can see here is that we use this, the same threat structure, but we applied it to a different system structure, which has been very powerful, you know? Yeah. yeah. Oh, and then you and then you you create the threat table from that, so it's the same idea. So the the process is really the same, and what changes? But what changes 
is really how you do the system analysis. And that's why I was saying up front, the harder part about threat modeling in this way is really doing the systems analysis. Um, but if you're getting the development team to leverage, you know, if you're leveraging the development team, they're doing a lot of that heavy lifting for you. Right. So, um, yeah, we're going to conclude with, you know, a couple of um, learnings and the next steps, and also we're going to open it up for Q&A. Okay. So from my side, you know, the next step is uh, one is to, for the metrics, right? The management likes metrics, like what's the return on investment? So, so um, you, know, you know, we're starting to measure, like, how many teams are doing this, you know, how many projects have been implemented uh, with this. And scaling the training, right? Different, we have like multiple locations and different time zones. And, you know, travel sometimes can be difficult, you know, and a one, one day call sometimes is too long. So how can we scale that? So, so we've been experimenting like, you know, can we chop it up into smaller courses and can we do it kind of like the, both learning and doing at the same time. So we experimenting different uh, approaches to that. And of course, you know, um, the coming up with these simplified system diagrams by the uh, product team, uh, the, the software engineers as the uh, basis for this is, is our next step. It, and it is valuable, you know, but it is um, different, uh, different projects dif uh, benefit differently from this. You know, as we usually uh, categorize the different projects into like high, medium, low, and for the, you know, medium and high, the, this is kind of like a mandatory. Uh, if not, then, you know, um, we will make a suggestion. But, you know, the point is that there are also other ways to secure a project. But you're still taking the lead. This, this, the, your last point of the security taking the lead is, that's pretty important. That, when we right. were going building the slides, I thought that was a key thing. Right. You know, it's like, you can't just say, poof, here you go. No, no, right? you, have, you, have, you have to teach them, and also you have to take the lead to start getting, yeah. you know, uh, get the pro practice going. Yep. Uh, so for me, uh, I, you know, the protocol threat models I think are, are key. I think one of them is, one thing is that it allows, it allows us to, to look at the system early on in, and in a level of detail that even DFDs don't like, let you get to. Um, my, my, the, the sort of the generalization is, is, you know, don't really get hung up about how you represent the system, whether it's a DFD, whether it's, you know, whatever representation. Let's see, hung up. Um, what's the, the colloquialism here is what? Um, not getting your knickers in a twist? Is that, is that <laughs> correct? <laughs> Okay, um, so that, uh, you know, I think it's, um, and the last thing is, is, is really building it around the development artifacts. It's like kind of going with the flow, you know. Don't try to create something that's not already there. Leverage what you have. It, it creates a better relationship with the developers, um, and I think it's everything, everybody will be much more productive. Right, in the end, you know, it's pretty simple common sense, at, right? There are only three actors involved, like attacker profiles, assets that you're protecting, and what's controls that are protecting the assets. And you juxtapose. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, any questions? Thanks. Uh, in terms of your training, uh, I take it you're looking at all your teams, all your architects, all ev literally everybody will have the same level of training. Right? That's a goal. Yeah, that's a, we we doing it. You know, uh, business by business. So we start with you know some business and start training them, and this ongoing process. You said you mentioned about um, cross boundary. So you've got teams in different parts of the world. Right. Uh, how how are you coping with that? So obviously you're not going to be able to roll it out. You roll that out in one team and the interactions. Between right. The so teams. Uh, we we are building this uh, community of uh, instructors inside the company. So um, you know I, I I'm one of the first batch of these instructors. Like you know Scott personally train us, and then uh, we train more people. So like there'll be like people in different time zones. So it's a cascade out. D definitely. Yeah. yeah. And we have to be careful not to dilute the content or alter the content too much along the way. So yeah, we tried to convince Intuit to hire Sigital for all that, but they were like, oh. no. <laughs> yes. Oh. Oh. Uh, you said you. Um, uh, I think you said you don't put in uh, in your threat table threats that you already have controls for. Right. So do you keep track of that somewhere else? Yes, like, we do. Yeah. Um, we keep track of. In different ways, one in the threat uh, threat model document, right? So these are the missing controls or the weak controls, especially. And also, we uh, keep track of that in the uh, workflow system, like Jira. So that becomes like a requirement or you know technical debt for the dev teams, so they can work off the list. 
But you could, I mean, so they use their threat table, you know, our, the process we use at Sigital, we have a thing called, I don't, I don't even know what we call it anymore. It's Traceability matrix? Traceability matrix. See, that's <laughs> much better than I am, man. Um, uh, yeah, the traceability matrix, it's really about, re for me, the traceability matrix is about residual risk. Right? And I think the reason that they don't put the, um, they don't put things where the control is sufficient in it is because that table is going to development and development says, I don't care. I got, I'm, you know, I'm good here. It's not going to go into my bug tracking system. Sorry, one other question. Um, do you have any automated tools that you use for this? You said you just use Visio for the diagrams, but you know, is there any link into your uh, requirements, tracking tools or uh, testing tools? Bug uh, we use what we have, so you know, Visio and Jira. All right, okay. Yeah, <laughs> that's one in the back. I think. Thank you. Thanks for the talk. Uh, in, in my experience, one of the things that makes threat modeling really hard is to come up with threats that are relevant to the system. Mm -hmm. So uh, to, to, uh, to identify not, not just a bunch of threats, but only those that are relevant, and to know when a threat model is, is good enough to be used. Have yeah, you done exactly. anything in particular in, in, in this work to, to address that? Because I, it's, it's, it's not an easy challenge. Yeah, I think that, I think that um, in, one of the things that's built into the, into the system is um, the assets and controls do help. The threat actors is really important because that because the the threat actors or threat agents or what do you call them? We talk attacker, attacker attacker profiles. profiles. So we have different names for them, and because <laughs> but anyway, um, that helps too because then you can start classifying. You can say, I don't really care about the insider threat. Okay, this person in the data center, very low. I don't really care about it. And you can go back to the business. Now you have a, a way of talking to the business about relative priority. Um, Yes, you, the, you're dealing with a, a problem that there are an infinite number of attacks and there are an infinite number of things that go wrong. But, but because you have assets, which you can a, a apply some quantity to in terms of the impact, and you have attackers, which you can say likelihood, now you have a way of, of, of at least doing a, some, some pre-filtering of the results. Because, because actually the metrics that you you were talking about, uh, looking to metrics, but also it would be really interesting to have metrics about when when is a threat model good enough. It's not about only about how many threat modeling have have I been uh, applying for how many projects, but also for one threat model, uh, when is it when is it okay? When is it when should I stop doing threat modeling and when can I use the results for yeah, a particular right. project? Yeah, I, I, we pretty um, the th my experience at Sigital is we just time box it. Right. Well, yeah, we have to do that. I just recommend that to like, you know, you do that threat model as a snapshot of your system and at the end of the exercise, close that threat model and for your requirements, you know, keep track of in the, in the JIRA or something like that. Right. And then redo that like every, uh, whenever you have a major system change that will ha affect the threat model. There's one here. The first thing you were doing was was draw, drawing your you know, internal networks and all your applications. How do you choose what level of details to draw in? Right, that's that's a judgment call, right? That's a, that's the hardest part of the coming up with this simplified system diagrams of you know what's in scope, what is not in scope. So it depends on your experience and maturity of the team, and maybe yeah. you have more experience. Yeah, I think that. One, so the one answer, so that sort of the, the answer for this group here at this talk is that that's why the training, I mean, part of why you do it is because that's a feel thing. Um, the other rule of thumb I use when I'm doing it is I, it's, I think about it like a lawyer. You know, a good lawyer only asks a question that he knows the answer to. I'm just, just kidding. But, um, but, no, but, but you're really trying to deal with, you know, it's going back to his question about how do you, do, how do you do, know when it's good enough. You want to start pretty high level, and then you're going to go, okay, well, I've got this. You know, you're, going to, you're not going to get anything too interesting, and so you're going to want to dig in. But what, what I think what happens with systems is that if you start with a, at, a, at a pretty high level, you're going to have a gut feel, and the engineers will have a gut feel for like, well, that part is kind of critical, and you're going to, you know. So that's the conversation with the development team too. Is yeah, that's why it's super important to have the development be involved in this because we don't know everything, you know, the consultants don't know everything, security engineers don't know everything. No, we know and, nothing, actually. <laughs> and not just uh, development engineers, but also the product management and so on. What, what time is it? Oh, yeah, it's, yeah. yeah. See, I used his watch. <laughs>
<laughs> it's about time for lunch. It's about time. Any other questions? Last one, maybe? Well, nope. No. Well, thank you very right, well, much. Thank you, you everyone. <laughs>